of you actually remember that video? That you were alive when it aired. Liars, it was May 15th, 1928. <laughs> so, obviously we know who that was, right? It was Mickey. Who created Mickey? Somebody? Disney? Did he? Disney was the brain behind Mickey, Mickey's character. But the true genius, the animator that came up with the actual image, the person who made him come to life is Disney's partner and friend, a guy named Oob Iwerks. This is his picture, Time Magazine. It's probably no one knew that. See, before Walt set off for Hollywood for, to make his fame and fortune, he and iWorks created a company called iWorks Disney Animation Studios. Unfortunately, that venture didn't last very long. So Walt made off for California. iWorks stayed behind. But as soon as things started to get rolling with Disney, he got a hold of his friend Ub Iwerks and said, hey, come and be a part of this new venture I'm part of. I'll give you 20% of the company. So Walt had the idea for the character, but Iwerks created him. Nearly all of the animation that goes into that was Iwerks and his artistry, sometimes turning out 600 drawings per day to make one of these short films. Disney got the credit. Iwerks faded into obscurity. But don't feel too bad for him. 20% of Disney made him a very wealthy person in obscurity. I suspect he's okay with that. See, the spotlight doesn't always shine on all of the players, does it? And we don't get to control who history remembers. But the truth is, for every significant event in history, where one person is pushed to the top and one person is remembered, there were many, many others in the supporting cast without whom the event never would have taken place. And we're calling those the people of the fine print. They're the extraordinary but lesser known people behind the scenes. Every historical event, every biblical historical event, every church, I would say every business is filled with those people. There is someone who gets credit. There's someone who's at the top. There's someone who's in leadership. But the reality is without all of the others, these things wouldn't exist. So our theme for the series is that the church is not built on the gifts and talents of the famous few, the Andy Stanleys and Craig Groeschels of the world. No, the church is built on the gifts and sacrifices of the unknown many. And if you've been around church for even a minute, you realize that without all of the people giving their time, talent to the church, the church could not exist. We've been looking at some of the behind the scenes individuals in the early church. And today we're going to look at a married couple. They are what I would say are poster children for a godly couple who have decided to live out a marriage on mission for Christ. And one of the things I hope that we're able to take from them as we study together is the importance of being on mission together, of being headed the same direction, having the same vision, God's vision for what he has in mind. See, whether you're married or single, the strongest and healthiest relationships, the strongest and healthiest communities are those that are on mission together, forged by a common commitment to something greater than ourselves. So 
being from a military background, I can just tell you from my perspective, there is something about being part of a military community that there's, there's, there's this instant bond. As soon as you don the uniform of someone defending the freedoms of America, you become part of an instant family. You're part of a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And it just happens because you're part of that. I can tell you every time we got assigned to a new duty station, there was someone there to meet and greet you. Someone showing you around. They helped you move into your house. They brought you meals. You just felt completely and utterly enveloped in that community. And the bond that you had was the fact that you were serving together. I think the same can be said for police officers, for firefighters, for medical professionals. I think there are lots of communities out there that have this common vision, this common goal, this common mission, and that automatically makes them an incredibly, unbelievably tight-knit community. And believe it or not, marriages share those same qualities when those marriages are committed to a shared vision a shared future. If you've been through marriage challenge, maybe you've even gone through the pain of divorce, or you have someone that you've walked through that with, one of the things you hear most often, one of the things I hear most often as a counselor, we weren't going the same direction. We had a different vision. He wanted to go this way. I wanted to go that way. So the lack of a shared mission and vision was probably one of the greatest things that caused the difficulty in the marriage. I believe the strongest marriages are those who not only have a shared vision, but those who are committed to God's vision and God's mission together. Now, I believe that not just because it's, well, I just want to, there's all kinds of things in life we want to believe are true that are not true. But for this particular thing, I think I have evidence to back it up. See, when I first got into seminary and I was, I was aware that I was going to be invited to be a part of, of couples' special days. I was going to be able to officiate weddings. So I wanted to do some research on marriage and, and find out what is it that I could maybe help couples realize makes marriage work or makes marriage stronger. And I assumed that faith was one of those things. I knew for a fact when I went into the research that I was going to discover that Christian marriages hands down stay together more so than non-Christian marriages. And to my surprise, when I started to win the research, for couples claiming to be Christian and those couples claiming no faith tradition, the divorce rate was one out of every two couples. I, I was shocked, quite frankly. But I continued to dig, and I realized I was asking the wrong question because there are a lot of people in the world who might claim Christianity, but they're not necessarily living out their faith. So when you look at couples who actually practice their faith together, not only claiming to be Christian, but actually doing things that Christian couples do. The divorce rate falls from one out of every two marriages to one in 10. One in 10. Now, if you've got friends and family who maybe are not people of faith and you want to help them make their marriage last, help them come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and make him central in their marriage and you're going to already exponentially increase the odds of that marriage lasting a lifetime, which is what they pledged to one another on that stage. Now, you really want to help them? What you find out is that couples who not only practice their faith together, go to church on a regular basis, but couples who serve and couples who pray together, the divorce rate falls to one in 500. One in 500. You want an absolute no kidding, almost guarantee that your marriage is going to last until you stop breathing? Practice your faith together. Serve God in ministry. And pray together. Excuse me. <coughs> the strongest marriages 
are those who not only have a shared vision, but those who are committed to God's mission and vision together. Now, now let me clarify. That doesn't mean you go into ministry and you have to serve doing the same thing, right? It means that you serve in your area of giftedness and talentedness. You practice your faith together. You serve wherever God has called you. I want to introduce you to one of those marriages. This is a relatively unknown couple that God decided he wanted them and their marriage recorded in scripture. One of the hallmarks of their marriage is that they are absolutely, positively, no kidding, committed completely to Christ. Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and he worked with them. Little background, little history. Emperor Claudius had had it up to here with Jews and Christians and their garbage. They fought constantly. They were constantly going in and saying, he said, she said, and Claudius was done with it. So he expelled all of the Jews and Christians from Rome. So Priscilla and Aquila get booted out of Rome. Their entire lives are turned upside down because of the intense conflict between the Christians and the Jews. Who's responsible for the conflict? Who is the one person that continues to stir the pot in Rome, can't stop talking about this Jesus guy and making the Jews angry? You know, who, who was that guy? guy named Paul. So wouldn't it be a natural, normal human response to be just a little miffed at this guy named Paul? I mean, they had a good thing going in Rome, Priscilla and Aquila did. They got a thriving business in one of the biggest cities in the empire. They got friends. They got family. They got a home. And because Paul won't shut the heck up, they get booted. And they move. And after they move, who shows up on their doorstep? But Paul. But instead of being angry, they embrace him. They invite him into their home to live with them. They invite him into their business to work with them. They support him financially. And what that tells us about this couple is that they, they are completely, utterly sold out for the cause of Christ, for the mission of the Lord. See, a marriage on mission is willing to put Christ first and yourselves second. It's not about your own comfort. It's not about how much you have or don't have. It's not even about the challenges you face because you're a Jesus follower. No, it's being completely committed and saying, I'm okay with those things not going well. They leverage their entire lives for Christ. But now, look at the extreme nature of their lives. Who, who does that? Packs up their entire household, sells everything they own, moves to a foreign country, all so people will come to know Jesus. These guys, they do that. For those of you who don't know them, this is Crick and Mindy Poyer and David and Beth Roberts. And they are missionaries that were sent out from this church. They sold their homes. I was there when it happened. I helped them move. They sold all of their belongings. They took all of the income from that and they put it in a fund so that they could go be long-term missionaries overseas. The Poyers went to Estonia. The Roberts went to Argentina. The ministry that David and Beth are doing right now in the lives of people who are suffering from addiction, specifically men, is phenomenal. They have brought 
person after person after person through the ravages of drug addiction and alcohol addiction to a place where they gave their lives to Christ and put families back together, completely committed to the cause of Christ. Crick and Mindy been in Estonia for probably seven years now. They have poured themselves into the lives of thousands of students. We know of students that have now chosen not only to be Jesus followers, but they themselves have gone on to be missionaries. They themselves are going to school to learn how to lead churches. Crick and Mindy started our first baby church in Estonia, and they've been invited by a nearby village to come start another one because there aren't any churches in that village. Two couples completely committed to the cause of Christ. So, I have a friend named Rick. He's a realtor. You're all going to put your homes up for... No. No, the reality is we can look at people like David and Beth and say, well... That's just not going to happen for me. Am I not completely committed if I can't go and do that? Absolutely not. You and I can be completely committed for the cause of Christ without uprooting our families and moving to a foreign country. Let me talk about some people, some couples right here that I believe are living out that commitment to Christ. One of those couples is Len and Jan Snyder. You may know them. Uh, Another couple is... Bill and Tina Squires Price, and they're here, and they're going to be mad at me. There's David and Johnny Tony, and the one thing that all three of those couples have in common, besides all of the other places where they serve the Lord, is they tutor kids at Green Mountain Elementary School through a program called Whiz Kids. They either are now or they have been tutors. Those are examples of couples who have chosen to live lives on mission for Christ, while at the same time living the rest of their life as well. The point is that each of us has the ability to follow the lead of Priscilla and Aquila. Each of us have the ability to follow the lead of our missionaries and our tutoring couples. Every single one of us can and should live lives on mission for Christ. But what it takes is a willingness to be completely committed. I'm going to press on in the book of Acts. And another lesson we're going to learn from this relatively unknown but oh so important couple in Scripture is that a marriage on mission for Christ, a life on mission for Christ, is unafraid of the uncomfortable, unafraid of the uncomfortable. You see, Paul stayed in Corinth for a time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and he sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Second time, they uproot their entire lives because of Paul. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Chancheria because of a vow he had taken. Don't know what that has to do with anything else in this passage, but it's in there, so I read it. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews. And when they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. And then he set sail from Ephesus. The thing that I want you to notice is the line that says, he left Priscilla and Aquila and he set sail from Ephesus. He deserted them. Now imagine that. You pack up and leave again. You follow Paul. You continue supporting his ministry. We find out later in some other New Testament books that talk about the life of this incredible couple that they they opened their home to be the meeting place for the church at Ephesus. See, the church at Ephesus is where you get that book in the New Testament called Ephesians, right? And then Paul leaves them. And it appears, as far as we can tell, people kept meeting in their home. Someone had to lead the church. And the only assumption we can make, because Scripture doesn't clearly tell us, is they must have been the ones who took on that role of leadership. How would you like that to happen? 
What do you think? Wendy and I get called away to some foreign land and we're leaving tomorrow. And you guys are going to be the new pastors and leaders of the church. What do you think? Who, who wants that job? No? That's exactly what happened to these people. But instead of complaining, instead of freaking out, they chose to be unafraid of the uncomfortable. I would say that one of the most uncomfortable times of our lives was when our church leadership asked Winnie and I if we would consider starting a brand new church. I never felt more unqualified or uncomfortable in my entire life. But we were obedient to our leadership, obedient to what we believed was a call that God had in our lives. And we decided to start Faith Mountain with a whole bunch of really incredible people. We had no idea what we were doing, but somehow God worked it out. Now, most of you are never going to be asked to go out and start a brand new church, but that doesn't mean you won't find yourself in the uncomfort zone. See, when you're living a life on mission for Christ, that happens a lot. It does. Just ask any one of our current life group leaders. When we approach them and ask them if they might be willing to lead a life group, the big lump they immediately got in their throat and the hard time they had swallowing and the fact that they felt so unqualified to do that and uncomfortable. Talk to any one of the volunteers in children's ministry right now. When they were first asked to go teach kids about Jesus, the first thing they went in their heads was, I don't know enough to be a teacher. I can't do that. That's uncomfortable. I can tell you, though, that each and every one of them who has chosen to embrace the uncomfort zone and step into those leadership roles has made an incredible impact on the lives of the people that God has given them to minister to. There's another uncomfortable situation that Priscilla and Aquila found themselves in that I think we find ourselves in often in churches. See, while they were meeting at their home in Ephesus, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. That's a key phrase. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So this is all supposition on my part. But if I were them, and I had been left in charge of this church, I would be beating the streets and looking with great fervor for someone else to come and take the job. Because that's not what I was called to do. It wasn't what I was gifted to do. And I just imagine that they were keeping their eye out for who the next leader of the church should be. And they, they heard about this guy, Apollos. So they went to hear him. And they were impressed. They were impressed by his sincerity. They were impressed by his love for God. They were impressed by his, the depth of his knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. And they were captivated by his charismatic ability to speak. And yet, there was something about him, something that was a little, a little green, something that wasn't, wasn't quite right yet. I'll bet that's happened to you sometime or another in your career of attending churches. You've walked in and you've listened to a sermon and you thought, you know, that, that person's not bad, but they, they have some growing to do. They're not quite there yet. And many of us, when we run into that person, we decide maybe this isn't the right place for me. 
And we go find a place with a preacher who's maybe a little more polished, a little more accurate. Priscilla and Aquila saw a man who could be used in a big way for Christ. But his message was missing a little something. You see, all he knew beyond the Old Testament scriptures was the baptism of John. And let me explain that. You see, Apollos knew who Jesus was. Apollos knew the Old Testament scriptures and the prediction of the Messiah. Apollos knew Jesus was that Messiah. But all he knew about Christianity at that point was, well, this guy John the Baptist said, repent, be baptized. So for him, it was all about the water. The thing that he didn't understand was that it's not enough to just know about Jesus. You have to know Jesus. It's, it's not enough just to know about baptism. You, you have to know and understand that while Jesus is the Messiah, you also have to come to him and say, you know what? I am just a messed up sinner in need of forgiveness. And I know you died for me. And I want you as my Lord and Savior. Because what happens in that moment is a baptism that Apollos had not yet known. It's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a time where the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell the heart and the soul of every new believer. Priscilla and Aquila chose to pour into the life of this guy Apollos and help him understand more fully the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now they could have written him off. They could have said, this guy's too much of a project. Could have tossed his resume in the trash and kept looking for that right person. But what they chose to do instead wasn't to leave him, but to embrace him, to invest in him, to disciple him and teach him the things that he didn't yet know. And what was the result of that? You realize as you continue to read the scriptures that Apollos became a leader in the Christian church on par with Paul and Peter themselves. And without this unknown couple choosing to pour into his life, that may never have happened. They discipled him. And discipleship is the responsibility of each and every one of us who call ourselves Jesus followers. See, if you've been a Jesus follower for more than a minute, someone discipled you. Someone poured into your life. Someone took the time to help you know Jesus a little bit more than you know him now. Someone took the time to help you grow more deeply in love with him than you were before you met them. For some of us, it was a Sunday school teacher or a life group leader, a personal friend, maybe a family member. So I need to ask the question. Think about it for a moment. Who discipled you as a young Christian? What name comes into your mind right now of someone who took the time to help you know Jesus better? My guess is that a name immediately comes in to your mind. I was talking with first service about this. It's a little bit more casual, intimate environment. And, and so one of them said a life group leader, and another one said that it was my dad. Another one said it was her son that taught her more fully about Jesus. The point is that each and every one of us have been discipled by someone, and they've helped us grow in our faith and our love. Of Jesus. I have had many people pour into my faith life over the years, but the one that comes to mind most readily and most quickly is a guy named Rick McKee. You guys know him as the chair of the elder board of this church. I just know him as a pastor and a friend who, when I started going to seminary, chose to disciple me. Two and a half years, he met with me every week at seminary. 
He would come in and he would sit down and he would ask me, how's it going? He would pray for me. He would pray with me. He would help me understand better some of the lessons that I didn't quite get from my seminary professors. He invested two and a half years of his life every week in me. And he still invests in my life today because we do ministry together right here. There's another question that's necessary. Because discipleship is our shared responsibility. Who are you discipling? And if you don't have a name immediately come to mind, I can tell you the answer. Nobody. And let me help you understand what I mean by discipling because we get into this paradigm of, well, if I'm not sitting down with somebody every week and we're opening a Bible and studying about Jesus, then I'm not discipling anybody, but that's not true. You disciple people in many, many, many different ways. You may be like my wife. She is currently taken on a role as a year-round volunteer for Samaritan's Purse. And because of that, we need some other people to come in and be a part of the Operation Christmas Child Santa Shop stuff that happens here. She has invited some others into that ministry. She is teaching them how to do that ministry. That's discipleship that's happening. If you are serving in any ministry in this church in some way, shape, or form, you are discipling other people. So who, who are you discipling? And if the answer is no one, that's got to change. It's got to change. Let me close with one more lesson from our couple this morning. And that's the fact that a life lived on mission for Christ is one that's in it for the long haul. A life that's lived on mission for Christ is one that continues until you stop breathing and you get to meet him face to face. In what is believed to be the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote, the book of 2 Timothy, before he died. Well, you know, people on their deathbed, they, they remember some of the most important people that have invested in their lives in that letter, Paul mentions Priscilla and Aquila one more time. It tells you how incredibly important they were to him in his life and ministry. But it also shows that they still are serving the cause of Christ. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to believe that they continued until they stopped breathing. I want to introduce you to Art and Margie Soliday. They're my friends. And they're both with the Lord now. And I do know that I get to see them again someday. They lived very long, as you can tell. They're very old and wrinkly people. <sighs> very long and very full lives. And theirs was a marriage on mission for Christ. They were in it for the long haul. I got to be there at the very end with both of them before they went to be with the Lord. They were founding members of a little white church in 1954 called Southwest Baptist. Southwest Baptist eventually became the Rock of Southwest, the church that sent us to plant this church. They both served just in numerous ministries. Art was an usher. Margie taught kids about Jesus. She held babies. They both served on missions boards. They hosted missionaries in their own home and they invested in them financially, just like our couple in the Bible. For 10 consecutive years, they went to a place in Texas to volunteer at a place called the Rio Grande Bible Institute. And then in the fall of 2006, they left that church that they had been at for 50 plus years because God called them to start this one and reach lost people for Jesus in Lakewood. Who does that? In their 80s, they became part of our lunch team. And they served God until they stopped breathing. And it is my prayer for myself, 
for you that we might be remembered the way that they're remembered. Jesus followers on mission for Christ to the very end of our days. Gosh, there's so many ways to do that. So many ways. Uh, excuse me just a second. We can sometimes get the wrong impression. I think the enemy puts in our head that God wants you to give up everything else fun and just serve him, period. But there's nothing that could be farther from the truth. You see, the God that you know and love gave you the life you have, the job you have, the marriage you have, the friends you have, the kids that you have, and he expects you and I to enjoy them fully. But he also expects us to add in to that abundant life serving in his church because it completes us to steal a line from Jerry Maguire. You and I are not complete Christians, completely devoted, completely committed followers of Jesus Christ unless we are using the gifts and talents that he gave us to reach the lost for him. He's just encouraging us to add serving to all the other priorities that we have. I want to share with you just one of the many ways that you can make an impact in the life of another while living on mission for Christ. And that's by becoming a tutor with WizKids. I want to invite my friend Marilyn to come up and join me. Marilyn is the field director, a field director with WizKids, and she oversees a number of sites here in the Lakewood area. Our site at Green Mountain Elementary is one of them. And I asked Marilyn to maybe come and just share with you the impact that she's seen from her perspective with WizKids. Thank you, young lady. Say hi, Marilyn. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, everyone. Um, WizKids is a fun way to make an impact for Jesus. Um, I just, there's so many things that we see each week. One story I want to tell you is about a little boy named Maurice. Maurice was a first or second grader. He came to WizKids the first time not having a good time. His face said, I don't want to be here, and his scowl was big. His tutor said, what's wrong, Maurice? Maurice, little boy, says, I'm black, I'm dumb, and I can't read. And Maurice crawled under a table. The tutor was excellent. He went and found an easy book, and he crawled under the table. Together, under the table, they looked at these words, they decoded each of the words, and Maurice was able to read each of those words, and they finished the book. The tutor looked at Maurice and said, you are smart, and you are reading a book. Maurice, his face changed. He didn't. He did not scowl anymore, he smiled. And his smile was big, and he carried that smile with him every, every week that he came to WizKids after that. WizKids is fun. Not all children are as challenging as Maurice was that first night. But if um, you want to make a difference for a child, and if you can love a child, if you can read, and if you can pass a background check, we need you. There are so many children out there like Maurice who don't have that extra help that they need. The difference that was made in his life by this unknown tutor is going to carry that boy throughout his schooling years. He goes to WizKids. He learns not just how to be a better student, but he learns about Jesus, how much Jesus loves him each week at club time. That's huge. These children don't necessarily go to church. Most of them don't. But they get to hear about Jesus, sometimes in schools. And that's awesome. It's a privilege we need to take advantage of. So if you have any inclination you might like to try this, you want to learn more, please come talk to me after um, service. I'd love to tell you more about WizKids. We need you. We need you once a week between October and April. We meet once a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, afternoons or evenings. So if three o'clock Monday afternoon isn't great for you, we have other sites, other nights. And there's a place for everyone. And there is a child out there with your name on him or her. We need you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Stick around. Thank you. 
I can tell you that there is always a greater group of kids than we have tutors available for them. So if this at all tugs on your heart for Green Mountain Elementary, if you're available at 3 to 4.30 on Monday afternoons, great. If not, there's lots of other sites, as Marilyn said. I'd like to pray for her. I'd like to pray for the ministry. I'd like to pray for our school, and I'd ask you to pray with me. Jesus, we are just grateful. And I, and I do. I think about the scripture that says, let the little children come to me. The greatest desire of WizKids is that we would bring those children to Jesus. The greatest desire we have is to make Jesus famous in their lives and the lives of their families. I thank you so much for the blessing of the WizKids program. I thank you, Lord God, for bringing us into it. I pray for each and every child that would be tutored this year. I pray for each and every tutor who will pour themselves into the life of a child. And in the end, we pray that kids are able to live better lives while here on this earth. But more importantly, they come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and live eternally. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. I'm getting out of your way. Let me close just by saying whether you're married or single, each and every one of us is invited to live a life on mission for Christ. Please choose to do more than just attend a church. Serve, give, love, grow, disciple, make an impact. Without you, the church will never accomplish all that God intends for it. Because the reality is that the church isn't built on the gifts and talents of the famous few, but on the gifts and sacrifices of the unknown many. If WizKids isn't your thing or a midweek ministry, there are some other opportunities. Ben's going to be over at the Reach Your Peak kiosk. Get involved in something for Christ. Thanks for being here today.